to the webinar today. We are attempting to record the webinar, so if we're successful, we will hopefully be posting a link to that recording um, online and we'll email it out to everyone. So with that, I would like to introduce our speaker, who is Hillary Isabrands, and she's with the FHWA Resource Center out of Colorado. Um, we are so pleased to have Hillary presenting for us today, even with all this new technology we're using for the webinar. Um, and I'm sure you've all, um, you know, had to learn a new process for logging into this webinar. We appreciate you taking the time to do that. I am making everybody an attendee as they join the webinar. If you could make sure your phone lines are muted, I'm going to attempt to make sure you're muted as well, just so we don't have any background noise that disrupts the presentation. Um, but with that, I think that's all the introduction I need to do other than just say, Hillary, are you ready? I sure am, Victoria. Thank you Great. so much for inviting me. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and I suspect there could be someone that's still in the morning time. I just uh, turned to, to 12 p.m. here in Colorado. Um, I'm thrilled to be with you all again. And um, I actually uh, was just in Ohio for uh, almost a full week, a couple of weeks ago. So every time I go to Ohio, I, I learn so much. And so I'm going to try to um, return the favor here and provide you all an update um, on roundabouts. It seems to be, um, even though roundabouts have been around for 20 years here in the U.S., it's hard to believe, um, we still are learning. We're still um, still learning on a, on a regular basis uh, in a lot of ways. And I think that that is an exciting opportunity for us all to engage each other on a regular basis, whether that's through uh, meetings like this or webinars like this. Um, the, the conference that Victoria hosted last fall in Ohio, uh, whether TRB, ITE, and just um, the exchange, the opportunity that we have to exchange information is, is outstanding. So I'm going to try to share some of the latest and greatest that I am aware of and have been tracking. Um, some of that is actually um, going on in Ohio. So I do have breaks uh, set up throughout um, the next hour here. So Victoria is going to help me out with any um, questions that are coming in and comments that you all have. So we'll pause about every six or seven slides to make sure that we're um, addressing any questions that, that you all might have. So um, I do try to, I do have uh, some Ohio photos in there. Hopefully you both are, re you all are recognizing the ones that are on that uh, front screen there. Um, that's uh, in uh, Franklin County, and then we've got Hilliard, Ohio on the left there. So I'm calling this, uh, as I step through uh, the webinar today, Roundabout Quick Hits. So not a whole lot of time on each individual topic, but again, just want to highlight some of the things that are going on and the areas that we uh, tend to continue to, to learn more. These probably aren't a, a proven in terms of uh, best practices, but these are emerging practices that we continue to do research, we continue to learn from projects on a regular basis. So I'll be touching on larger vehicles, pedestrian facilities, again, some of the other noteworthy practices that are going um, on both in Ohio as well as nationally, guidance and tools, um, emerging topics, so things that are less common um, when it comes to roundabouts. Uh, looking at resources and, again, have an opportunity at the end for some Q&A together. So let's, let's think about large vehicles. Um, again, the image on the right, you can see there's actually a, a city bus side by side next to a fire truck uh, that's going through a roundabout. Again, that one happens to be in Ohio. Um, there's just a lot of different, look at, I, I guess in my opinion, think about how that might relate to um, when you are doing in when, when you are doing a design, when you are in the design process, and we lay out our design vehicles, um, we oftentimes are using tools to help us guide us to make a decision on how wide should the circulatory roadway be, how big should the truck apron be. Um, really taking that and translating that and transferring that to what we do in the office um, with our design tools and what we see out in the field is really, really important, especially, again, with roundabouts, even though they've really only been around, um, you know, in some areas less than 10 years in the U.S., it's, it's important that we, we learn from all of our projects. 
Um, the photo on the left, that happens to be actually from the International Roundabout Conference that was held in 2017 up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I'll talk a little bit more about that. We had a great opportunity to engage the uh, freight industry at that conference. I encourage you with your projects and, and um, as agencies and, and consulting firms to really um, extend that invitation to um, stakeholders, special users, or just your, your average users on your roadway um, to understand how they're navigating the roadway. Our understanding might be a little bit different from what they're actually having to experience and, and negotiate uh, through the roadway itself. So, again, uh, there was a, a truck tour at the roundabout conference. Uh, this was our driver, uh, the, the truck driver uh, from Schneider Trucking that came out as a part of the conference. We had a, a big group that went out, and uh, he drove that roundabout every which way he possibly could, from the inside lane to the outside lane, straddling the lanes, on the truck apron. Um, and then we had an opportunity to interview him afterwards, and I, I have shared some of the takeaways that um, that I have gained from that experience uh, with, at TRB. I had an opportunity to do that, but I wanted to share that with this group uh, as well. So some of the takeaways were um, that left, sometimes uh, we, we ha have that and encourage that left supplementary yield sign. Um, again, particularly with multi-lanes, because you might have, say, a large truck in the left lane and you're a car, um, or vice versa, um, it always is good to re be reminding drivers that they have to yield and yield to both lanes if there's multiple lanes in the circulating roadway. And what the, our drivers told us was, you know, I, I understand why you guys have that sign, but when I approach the yield line, oftentimes that seven foot high yield sign is right in my line of sight. And so when I am trying to make a decision on that gap and look to the left, not always, but sometimes that supplementary sign is, is directly in, in my way for me to be able to determine um, or to see a vehicle. So I thought that was a, a, an interesting takeaway and something that we can think about and really probably an easy fix in the field. Drivers, and this is truck drivers, will defer to straddle if they don't think they have enough room. So this was something, um, again, Snyder Trucking is a big trucking outfit, outfit and um, so this is a takeaway from not only this driver's experience, but from his colleagues as well. Uh, drivers, um, in terms of the freight industry, um, their, their goals are similar to ours in the transportation profession. To be safe um, and, and have a safe experience on the roadway, as well as be efficient. And uh, one of the things that we do know in, in certain trucking outfits or um, companies is that if you get into a crash, you can lose your job. So it's very, very serious business in terms of, of the drivers making sure that they're negotiating a roundabout or anywhere else on our roadway network um, and making sure that they um, are, are approaching an intersection and traveling through an intersection in a safe way. And one of the ways that he shared with us is that if, if I am able to, I will straddle even though I have enough room to stay in my own lane. And that's a big takeaway for us as designers and as, uh, as uh, professionals um, that, who are designing roundabouts and um, owning and operating the roadways because we, we tend to, I would say, in some cases, um, over-design. We've got case one, case two, case three that came out of research that was done in um, Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, but I think we're at a, state, a stage now where we're rethinking on what that looks like because if, if we're designing it um, so everyone can stay in there, the large trucks can stay in their lane side by side, but that's not how anyone ever drives it, we have to ask ourselves, are we, are we, should we be designing it differently? Um, and I think that's where we're at right now um, as an industry. The next bullet there, if a truck is stopped on entry, usually it takes about 15 seconds to get um, the truck moving again if it's loaded. Again, that time, so if that truck driver is, is judging a gap, um, he's got to account for the fact that it'll take him a little bit longer to actually get up and get going and moving into that roadway. Um, so again, when we think about capacity, and, and we do have adjustments, obviously, uh, for trucks and our capacity analyses, um, but that's something that they have to take into consideration as well as they um, drive the roundabout. Once a truck starts turning, the driver cannot see a car next to them, um, even with their mirrors. So 
So, for example, what he was saying is on the approach. As soon as I start turning, as soon as he starts turning his his wheel, he immediately gets blind spots. Um, and so that is part of the reason why they they will um, again straddle because um, they feel there's a, a little bit more comfort with that. But as soon as they start negotiating, we all know. Um, think about the approaches to a roundabout. Think about the roundabout itself, the circulatory roadway itself. We're, we're constantly turning our steering wheel as, as drivers. And when, that, when you're a truck, that means a lot of blind spots. Um, and if you have other drivers that aren't paying attention, that can be a situation that you, you really want to avoid. And then last but not uh, least here, in, in terms of the takeaway of that uh, time out in the field, uh, most uh, truck drivers will not drive side by side at a roundabout, even if it's large enough um, to do so. They will take turns because, again, there's less risk involved. So think about what that means in terms of our design, in terms of our footprint um, at the roundabout itself. Um, but even, quite honestly, think about um, the impacts of a large truck volume at an intersection and what that might mean for capacity, perhaps. Um, and I think that these are, these are things that you can do in your own backyard for your own projects. Um, I talked with uh, Dave Holstein uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was there. We talked a little bit about maybe um, in Ohio uh, doing some outreach with the freight and trucking industry to talk a little bit more, learn more from them, and hopefully they will also learn from us as the practitioners, the designers, the owners and the operators of the roadway. Also um, in Wisconsin, uh, we had an opportunity. This happens to be an oversized overweight uh, route here where you can see that there's actually an opening through the center island. Uh, there's gates there, so the photo on the right actually is that same intersection. This is, again, just outside of Green Bay, pretty industrial area. So we are always looking for different situations, um, right? So uh, how, how, in this case, there was a dominant movement. There was a dominant uh, left mo movement that was occurring um, coming from the top of the screen. And so they made sure that that oversized, overweight truck could get through there for that particular movement. They didn't necessarily design the roundabout, um, the entire roundabout, for that oversized, overweight vehicle to make every single movement. They focused on the movements that those trucks had to make. And that's, again, where you can still right-size your design, even though you might have a very large vehicle going through your intersection. So stepping back and thinking about um, how that vehicle is going to go through and, and, and what um, particular design features you might have to modify to make sure that that can happen safely for not only that driver uh, and those users, but also all the other users uh, that are negotiating the roadway. Always good, again, that education. Um, Wisconsin, again, is, is uh, always coming out with new and innovative public service and, and education uh, that we can draw from, we can borrow, we can modify, we can uh, retrofit to our particular situations. Um, again, um, uh, Federal Highways has had a noteworthy practice in Wisconsin. They, and I, I'm not sure if it's still going on, but at one time, their freight group um, and the designers were meeting regularly. They would go on, um, on, on ride-alongs out into the field, um, particularly perhaps if they were going to be putting roundabouts or were considering roundabouts on a corridor, a freight network, or a truck route, or, or an oversized overweight route. And so again, it's just opening up that communication um, so you've got a, more of an open dialogue um, with, somewhat, with, a, with a user that's very, very critical um, to, to what we do every day in design. I'm also going to mention um, Wisconsin, again, uh, not to focus on Wisconsin, but they really are the state that has the most roundabouts on the state system. They have well over 200 roundabouts on the state system and over 300 roundabouts overall in the state of Wisconsin. So we really need to look to them, learn from them, um, but also adapt and modify how it might be appropriate in, in Ohio and on a state highway versus on a local roadway and what that looks like. But in fact, um, in 2015, there was actually an act. And if you read through that, it, it says the act permits the operator of a large vehicle or combination of vehicles to deviate from the lane in which the operator is driving to the extent necessary to approach and drive through a roundabout. So basically, that's giving the, the truck driver the permission to straddle the lane. It also mentions the act also requires the operator of a small vehicle, defined as a vehicle that is less than 40 feet or 10 feet wide, 
to yield the right of way to any large vehicle or combination of vehicles when the small vehicle operator is approaching or driving through the roundabout at approximately the same time or so close as to constitute a hazard of collision. So again, they are reinventing themselves in terms of their, their vehicle code and their laws, and then ultimately um, looking at safety and how, uh, what violations that are actually out there. So again, a lesson learned. Um, again, in my recent visit in Ohio, we had the conversation about the importance of making sure that we acknowledge and include roundabouts in the driver's manual, in the um, driver's manual as well as in the vehicle code. Um, and not just roundabouts, think of the, the diverging diamond interchange and you've got a, there's a CFI near Dayton and uh, re restricted crossing U-turns. Um, it's my understanding there's multiple projects that are on the books potentially for those to get constructed. So we need to make sure that the drivers are aware. Um, it also is very important for our law enforcement um, if there is some sort of an, an incident to be able to uh, make sure that that we can address um, and, and it's all about education as well and, and safety is number one but just wanted to share that with you in case you weren't aware of it and we've got about one last slide here on on the larger vehicles uh, again as you engage um, the users of large vehicles in, the, in that industry um, get out in the field with them and the, the image on the left is actually a video from Florida DOT their district one where they had a very very compact I'm going to call it compact roundabout on the state highway system. Um, they're designing for about 115 feet uh, diameter, 115 foot diameter, um, very constrained in terms of right away, but a very high crash location. Um, and they wanted to make sure that they got a solution in there that was going to work. But they also had a lot of farming equipment and large trucks coming through that area. So they spent the time, they laid it out with cones and paint. And, and if you've been in one of the classes that I've done, I usually do show this video. They learned a lot. They learned um, how really uh, conservative auto turn can be if you're just using the default, default values. Um, they also just learned the, the perception of, of um, the drivers, the truck drivers, and what they were looking for as they negotiated a roundabout. And the image on the right is actually from um, a roundabout in Kerman or near Kerman, California, where this is more of a public education piece where they opened up, um, they laid out with paint, it's a little bit hard to see, um, but they laid out the roundabout that they were, had designed um, at that phase in the design. And they invited everyone to bring whatever piece of equipment, vehicle that you wanted to. You can see someone brought their RV. There's actually a flatbed truck out there. They had farming equipment. So it was a way to educate, but it was also a way to inform the designer educate the public and informing us as um, the folks responsible for um, getting a good design and, a, and a, an appropriate, appropriate design for the context um, that was that's out there. And then last but not least, for those of you that um, do get some snow, and I'm pretty sure you guys, I think parts of the, the state of Ohio had some snow um, this uh, recently here, is that's another group, your maintenance folks, the folks that are out there, whether it's plowing or it's sweeping or whatever it might be, talking to them about what kind of room they need, what kind of curbs work for them and what kind of curbs don't work for them. Um, that eight truck apron design, that interface between the circulatory roadway and the truck apron itself, what does that curb look like? And even the back of the truck apron, what kind of features do you have on um, that, that that could potentially affect um, from a maintenance perspective or, again, a, a large vehicle that might be going through there? So this is, again, the photo on the right. That's a ride-along. This is in California where we did a, a snowplow rodeo. Um, that's the maintenance yard on their left. We laid out the roundabout with cones and, and paint, and then we went and drove um, the nearest roundabout that we could to just have an appreciation for um, maintenance's comments and trying to address them as we could um, with the next roundabout that was going in in that area. So I'm going to pause there, um, see if there's any questions, Victoria, that have come in related to large trucks. Um, None so far, but one thing I want to try while we're at this pause, if you don't mind, is I'm going to try muting everyone, and then, Hillary, I will unmute you so you can keep okay. talking, but just to make sure we cut down any background noise. This is, since this is new technology, I didn't want to just tr do it without letting everybody know. Okay, Hillary, can you try talking? Sure. Oh, yeah, we still hear already. you, <laughs> okay. so hopefully that takes care of any background noise. 
and um, you know, I'll unmute everybody at the very end. But please feel free to enter any questions you have on the chat pod that you should be seeing on the left-hand side of your screen. If you don't see the chat pod, there is like a little thought bubble in the bottom left-hand corner that you should be able to press in order to display the chat pod. Um, go ahead and put your questions in there. All right, Hillary. Okay, sounds good. All right, so we'll move on to the next quick hit related to roundabout. We'll talk a little bit more about pedestrian facilities. Um, I know that there's been a lot of work in this area, um, particularly over the last 10 to 15 years, that is predominantly focused on accessibility. But I just want to, again, repeat some of that and just make sure you're aware of um, some of the things that I think are, are um, emerging. Uh, the ideas have been out there, but we're actually seeing people act on some of the potential infrastructure alternatives. So I've shared this with before, um, perhaps some of you have seen this. Um, when we consider pedestrians, we want to look at, there's a lot of things that we need to look at. We need to look at conflicts uh, with pedestrians and vehicles, pedestrians and bicyclists. We want to be um, very conscious of accessibility. There's a lot of accessibility research that's, that's gone on again in the last 10 years with um, the National Cooperative High Research Program. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Speed, we know speed makes a big difference when it comes to pedestrians. Um, so how are we in our designs with roundabouts? How are we addressing that in our approach curvature um, at the crosswalks? What, is that, what does that look like? Um, and what is that interaction between driver and pedestrian? Yielding rates, how often are drivers actually yielding to pedestrians in crosswalks? Um, and this is, this again is a, this can apply not only to roundabouts, but, but anything that we're designing where we've got pedestrians are, that are interacting with the um, vehicles. Sight distance, of course, is critical. And we do need to think of everyone, all pedestrians, um, young pedestrians, older pedestrians, pedestrians that might have a walker or a wheelchair or a cane or on crutches, uh, folks that are sight impaired, we really, really need to pay attention to all of those different dynamics as we're considering the design features on our roadway. Uh, something a little more traditional, of course, is the delay. What kind of delay are we inducing to pedestrians? Um, we oftentimes focus on the driver, um, but we need to remember that, that uh, pedestrians are a vital part of our roadway network as well. And then that connectivity. How are those pedestrian facilities connecting to other, perhaps a bus stop or to a community or to a school? So these are all things that we look at and can, can um, help evaluate these as we're looking at um, our projects. So obviously here I'm relating it primarily to roundabouts, um, but that, that is an important thing to look at those performance metrics no, no matter what you're looking at for design alternatives. We also know that the multiple threat situation on multi-lane roadways is always a concern um, for pedestrians. So you can see the image on the top um, where you've got the multi-lane roadway. The first car might stop to let the pedestrian cross, but the other car, um, for whatever reason, might not see the pedestrian or be in a hurry. And so uh, they immediately um, continue on the roadway and there is potential for a pedestrian to be hit. Um, so one of the ways that we can address that is by having an advanced stop or yield line. Now this applies to both at a mid-block crossing as well, um, potentially at a roundabout, where you are um, advising drivers to be aware of that crosswalk. And then um, by putting in some signing and some marking, you can try to get some better yield control or stop control in advance of that crosswalk and less risk for those um, pedestrians that are crossing. So just a reminder, obviously, that um, the faster we're going, the more risk that pedestrians are in our roadways. So think about the speed limits, and not only the speed limits, but the operating speeds on the roadways that you are owning and operating or that you um, are designing projects for. Um, pretty quickly, you get out of um, this uh, safe zone, so to speak, related to speed when it comes to pedestrians. So we need to always keep that in mind as we think about um, our projects. And, and honestly, I think uh, as users of the roadway, whether you're a pedestrian or a driver or a bicyclist, 
Um, we need to, we can take the experiences that we have maybe on our personal time and relate that and translate that into hopefully um, safer designs for pedestrians um, in our work itself. I want to provide you all with an update. So for those that maybe didn't see, um, two days ago, uh, the METCD team through Federal Highways actually came back out with an update on the rectangular rapid flashing beacon. So the, pretty much two days before Christmas of 2017, so just a short few months ago, the interim approval for the RF, um, RFB was rescinded by Federal Highway Administration. So here we are um, on March 20th of 2018. Um, RFBs are back on the table. Um, all of the pending patents um, were no longer in place anymore. And you will see there was actually a second update that came out a day later, so the 22nd of March. Um, all of the latest and greatest of information is on the METCD website. There is a brand new interim approval. So even though you may have had interim approval before, um, once the uh, approval was rescinded in December, we have to start all over again. So we do have a new interim approval for the rectangular rapid flashing beacon, um, but you would still need to seek that approval uh, working with uh, Ohio DOT as well as the Federal Highways Division Office to get that interim approval to continue using uh, the rectangular, rectangular rapid flash beacon. So from a safety perspective, from a performance perspective, we're thrilled to see this update um, and, and that extra tool in our toolbox when it comes to addressing the pedestrian safety, but having that driver awareness, the visibility and accessibility. I'm going to show you a concept here. This is a concept of a raised crosswalk um, at a roundabout. Um, there are a few raised crosswalks out there at roundabout. Some were put in uh, for temporary reasons and, um, and studied, and then uh, later were pulled out. Uh, but we do have some examples um, now, um, a couple on the ground, and a couple that I think are coming to a neighborhood near you. Um, I believe that uh, the city of Hilliard is looking at a couple of their next couple of roundabouts to have raised crosswalks. So we will be <clears throat> watching, um, watching that and, and supporting the city of Hilliard in terms of that, um, that implementation of the raised crosswalk. So raise, the raised crosswalk, um, you know, that, that's different, obviously, than an RFB or a pedestrian hybrid beacon or just the, the traditional mark, crosswalk marking that we might have. It really physically makes the driver react, okay? So we're not talking about a speed bump. We're talking about a speed table. We're talking about thought put into the design in terms of making sure that low clearance vehicles can get across it. Um, we're, we're conscious of that type of design. But really, <clears throat> the raised crosswalk, does force the driver to react. Oftentimes that reaction is laying off the gas pedal, slowing down and going up and over the speed table. Um, and that is very important when it comes to yielding rates, when it comes to um, the safety of pedestrians crossing, as well as accessibility as we've seen in some of the accessibility studies. So here's a look, um, stepping away from the raised crosswalk, and I think I'm going to get back to that in a minute here. But um, after the September uh, Ohio Roundabout Conference, I actually, um, I don't know if Trisha is on the phone today, but I met Trisha and her friend who is blind um, and her uh, companion dog uh, out there in the field. And we walked the roundabout um, there. Again, this is in Franklin County. Um, there is an RFB at this particular location. And I really just observed and asked questions um, and asked her how, you know, how does she know where to go? And typically what she said was that um, I usually get familiar with an area before I go out by myself. Uh, so someone might come out and, and help her familiarize. She had never been to this location before, so it was new to her. Um, so she was a little disoriented in terms of where everything was, but Trisha did an excellent job of describing everything to her. She said that oftentimes she is, if she's in an intersection area, um, she is looking or listening for those locator tones to help her know um, where to, to go to. Um, she's also obviously looking, or sorry, uh, obviously listening for traffic. Um, she's got a keen sense of, of um, 
how traffic is, is moving in the intersection. And so she pauses and listens to, to make sure she's understanding it before she's crossing the roadway. But those locator tones become very important. The curbing becomes very important for her as well. Um, her, her dog is, is trained um, in ways to, again, help look for some of those things. She does give the commands to the dog, um, but it was amazing to, to be out there and to watch um, her cross the road and, and some of the things that, um, that were, were very interesting. Um, we had some pretty aggressive drivers that day for some reason. Um, in fact, um, I, I got stuck between two cars in the crosswalk. They both um, went on either side of me. Um, so that was kind of a, a little bit of a, a eye opener for me that we really need to work on the education and, and those yielding rates and get drivers to be a little more respectful for all of our pedestrians um, that are, are in our area. So again, another opportunity to reach out to folks in your community um, and work with them and ask them to, to help you understand how they're navigating the roadway. And then hopefully we can have a really good design um, for all of our users. Hillary, we have a question that's come in. Sure. Do the raised sure. crosswalks have impacts on fastest path analysis? All right. Oh, that's a good one. Let me think about that one. Um, they shouldn't. I would still, um, I'm, I have not had that question before. Um, I would say you're still going to do your fastest path analysis the same way. Because again, that fastest path analysis is a theoretical fastest path analysis. It assumes there's no other vehicles in the roadway, and that car is just going to dominate the, the roadway however they want and go as fast as they possibly can through, um, through the intersection. And so just, again, off the top of my head, thinking through this and visualizing that and looking at how our uh, fastest path guidance is written in NCHRP 672, I don't think that we would change it because technically, again, what the vehicle actually does, um, of course, would be different because they'd be flying over a, a raised crosswalk if they were speeding through um, the speeding through the roundabout itself. Um, so my initial reaction is, is, no, we would still probably do it the same way. I guess, like I said, the results would be different for the car. Um, it wouldn't be as easy to go um, fast through there um, on that fastest path alignment because you are you do have something physical in front of you. So great question. Um, I'm going to think about that one. I'm going to write that one down a little bit more. Um, but like I said, I think it, it, it's the, the race crosswalk actually can become a deterrent for fast, um, you know, that five percentile of people that just kind of do what they want to do. Thanks, Victoria. So these, this is just the results. Um, so on the right, you've got the, the, which was part of the research that was done in Golden, Colorado. So you've got a raised crosswalk on the left, and you've got the pedestrian hybrid beacon on the right. And this, this is just a reminder to folks that the results of that, to me, were, um, were really important in terms of the, the uh, yielding rates, uh, the interventions, or the lack of interventions in this case, between the hybrid beacon and the raised crosswalk. Um, if you look at the before and after, you can see um, what type of, of treatment was out there. The O&M is the, um, the um, specialist, mobility specialist intervention rate. It was zero for both the pedestrian hybrid beacon and the raised crosswalk. The average delay was less with both of the treatments, um, the pedestrian hybrid beacon and the raised crosswalk, um, and slightly more uh, in terms of uh, the delay for the pedestrian in terms of making that decision when to step into the roadway. But again, as a as a, in this case, it was for accessibility. We had blind participants out there that they were able to, in some cases, hear that driver slowing down or taking their foot off the gas and reacting to that raised crosswalk. And so um, based on the observations of this study, that's why um, we're seeing such similar results in terms of um, both the intervention, which is zero, which is outstanding, and then um, the delays or the difference in delays here. So just want to remind people of those nuggets of information that are in some of the research that we have. Uh, so that was part of the NCHRP 674 uh, pr project. And then Federal Highways did uh, some work, uh, some research on evaluating rectangular rapid flashing beacons. And that's the um, one of the first slides that I showed you with kind of that diagram in terms of looking at uh, 
degree of curve and interventions and um, speed, that all came from that research. And then most recently, we've got um, the NCHRP 834, which was a, more or less a continuation of the NCHRP 674 study, but looked in more detail and providing more options um, and guidance for us as practitioners to um, make sure we were um, assessing the situation appropriately for the, the volumes, the speeds, the geometry, the context, and then providing some um, helpful um, helpful ways to kind of walk ourselves through um, making the decision on what's ultimately the best solution for your project. We'll stop there again. Um, Victoria, are there any other questions related to pedestrians? Um, was today's RRFB news from Federal Highway mentioned today? I think we know the answer. We just sent an, an email on our listserv, Hillary, right before this webinar okay. about that as well. Great. Okay, excellent. So um, we're all feeling, I guess, pretty good about that. Because again, remember the reason why that was rescinded was um, for patent issues, not because of the performance of a device. And so we're, we're very pleased to see that back um, in our toolbox. So I'm gonna start talking a little bit more about some noteworthy practices. So um, what, what's going um, well and I would say that, you know, the education uh, with, the, with the dynamics of social media and YouTube and all sorts of different ways that we can communicate, I think it's uh, important to be thinking outside of the box, um, remembering to use the, the stuff that we've always used in terms of education. Um, but we do need to be a little more proactive with roundabouts or, or anything new for that matter. Um, think of your DDI up there um, on Roberts Road or even a pedestrian hybrid beacon or a rectangular rapid flash, flash beacon for that matter, making sure we're getting that message out to the public, um, utilizing your local news media. Um, the drive like a Dubliner um, video is the cutest thing I've ever seen. Um, that's, that's a great one, using humor. Uh, Wisconsin has done that as well in their, um, in their take it slow video. And in, in the bottom there you can see they actually have a record player and they're overlaying a roundabout and they talk to drivers on staying in their lane. So it's being creative. Um, I've, I've oftentimes I've used the example also from Wisconsin where when you get your new tag for your license plate on your car, your, your annual registration, they oftentimes are sending little snippets of how to drive a roundabout because um, those do get out to all, um, all folks in Wisconsin that actually own a car and have um, plates or registered plates um, in Wisconsin. So again, thinking creatively on how you can reach the public um, to the best of your ability. Of course, Federal Highways, we've got our resources, our, our video is pretty older now, but we've got a lot of more unique uh, things, things that are coming out there. Um, Washington County uh, Road Commission in Michigan has been doing some unique education and outreach uh, out there, Mark McCullough has been doing um, some different things that you might be interested in checking out. And then just sometimes the, the videos, the ability for us to have high quality videos is at our fingertips now. Um, and in capturing that and sharing that, um, whether you're talking to the public in a public meeting or to a, to a decision maker uh, or to an elected uh, official as well, um, just thinking of different ways of how we can communicate. And, and communicating often um, is, is probably the best, the best piece of advice um, don't wait for that project to come before you start communicating on um, the benefits of the roundabouts. And, and, and be, be honest, talk to them about some of the challenges with roundabouts as well. Um, it's, we, we sometimes paint just the pretty picture, um, but it's important to talk about um, the pros and the cons of, of, of everything that we do. So again, uh, talking a little bit more about the noteworthy practices. Again, we've got a huge opportunity here with the sixth edition of the Highway Capacity Manual to be using the latest and greatest information that we have related to capacity in the US. Is it perfect? No, um, but that's okay. We really still are in our infancy and roundabouts in the US and we will continue to learn. We will continue to get more data um, and, and we will continue to, particularly in the multi-lane uh, roundabout realm, we'll continue to see that evolve. Um, when, as it pertains to capacity. And I just remind everyone, don't forget about the data behind those equations. Never forget about the data. There's a big spread in that data you can see on the image on the left. Um, even though the red line um, on the left, which comes from the Federal Highways Topor 34 project, which then 
ultimately ended up um, as the Highway Capacity Manual 6th Edition model. Uh, it's important to remember that that's, that's basically the average. And so where do you fall? Where does your community fall in that graph, in that data? Um, you would see in the Topper 34 project, we did also, um, we did an overlay with Carmel, Indiana. We, we collected a lot of information, a lot of data, sorry, uh, from Carmel, Indiana. And if you want to guess where they were, they were above that red line. They were exhibiting a little bit higher capacity. Um, and really, it's because they have well over 100 roundabouts in that community. So we might expect that people are a little bit um, better um, at negotiating roundabouts at, at every turn, literally. So it's important to, to perhaps consider um, once you've got a, maybe a critical mass of roundabouts in Ohio, might you want to dig a little deeper in terms of, of calibrating this national model to what you're seeing and what you're observing um, in Ohio or in, in particular regions in Ohio. So um, if you are um, reviewing a project or doing a project, make sure that you are um, looking to, um, you know, Highway Capacity Manual, both the most common tools that are used is Sidra and Rodell. Both of those are, have now included the Highway Capacity Manual 6th edition as part of their tools. Um, that we can be using. And do remember, um, a high capacity two-lane roundabout um, in the Highway Capacity Manual, um, you've, you've kind of met its limits. So um, at that point in time, you do need to look at, to our international partners for, for guidance and that engineering judgment um, if your traffic volumes are, are at that tail end of that multi-lane. or and really, because we just don't have the data yet in the U.S. So it's, it's not a fault. It's just it is what it is. Um, I want to continue to always encourage folks to look at compact roundabouts. Um, I think we, the, the original design or the original guide in 2000 did talk about an urban compact, which was anywhere between like 80 and 100 feet. Um, that kind of went by the wayside, I think, when we updated our, our guidance in 2010. And uh, we really need to challenge ourselves. Do we need, how big do we really need um, to get our vehicles through there? The upper left, that is from Kings Beach. Uh, California, uh, I believe that one is about 115 uh, foot diameter. There's another one just down the road that's 107 foot diameter. Uh, it's a state route. They've got large vehicles, big buses that come through there, and um, they they have. In some cases, they are using the apron. They don't always have to use the apron, um, but yeah, they have to go a little bit slower. They might be navigating that roundabout at 10 miles an hour versus um, one that's 150 foot diameter, and you might be able to go 25 miles per hour through it. There's a mini roundabout on the bottom left there. That's from Shakopee, Minnesota. Um, it's a, a nice one near a school where they completely eliminated um, a lot of the the traffic um, during peak periods at, in the school period at, in the school time. You can see nice blanket of snow there. You can see exactly where people are driving. I've mentioned innovative construction methods before, and that's more specifically looking at how roundabouts can fit into design-build projects um, and utilizing um, um, CMGC method, where, again, it's similar to design-build, uh, but you do oftentimes, there is different rules, if I can call them, in terms of the negotiation, ultimately, um, of the um, project itself. But you are getting the contractor on board sooner um, and I've seen those be very successful. Colorado has actually been a leader in many projects using CMGC where they're getting the uh, contractor on board, you know, at say 60, 70 percent design and helping them fine tune that final design and then um, negotiate the terms of the, the construction costs and, and um, again, have that team in place as you're moving into construction. The project on the right is uh, Pecos and I-70. Um, that was, there's a lot of things going on on that project, um, but it was a pretty complex um, signalized intersection, uh, MSE walls, uh, they had accelerated bridge construction on that particular project. You've got a separate PED bridge um, in that area, schools, bus stops, um, lots, lots going on. And um, that CMG process really brought in the contractor at the right time to help make um, do some tweaking on that particular project. So the roundabout is actually partially on that structure um, over the interstate. Other projects that have also been successful in the design build area related to roundabouts um, as well as CMGC. 
temporary roundabouts, I think, are becoming more and more popular. It seems like every month I hear about a new project where an agency has looked for looked at um, using a temporary roundabout, either in construction, which is what you see on the bottom, that is um, uh, near uh, Modesto, California, and uh, the upper left. That's actually uh, basically a mini roundabout that they put in in advance of a more permanent roundabout that's going to go in at that location. That's pretty much that's a, a county road, um, a local road that um, they they did a little before and after study. They put that in and they were so pleased with how that uh, performed versus the stop signs that they're going to move forward with a, a more permanent type design um, coming up, I believe, sometime this year. The image on the right is from, it's off of I-5 in Bellingham, Washington. There's actually a series of roundabouts here that were originally put in as, as temporary. Um, if you go to this site, uh, this is near Ferndale, so north of Bellingham, Washington, you'll see that the two off-ramps, um, really it's, it's a matter of using some um, flexible tubes, some markers, and some signs uh, to create uh, a roundabout. They were having backups. It, I know it doesn't look like it in that picture, but they were having significant backups on the interstate on those ramps. And by changing the, the, um, the ramp terminal control uh, from stop control to roundabout, um, that pretty much completely alleviated, alleviated the issues that we're having, not only from a capacity issue, but also from a safety issue uh, with the large speed differential between the interstate speed and um, the off-ramp itself. Interchanges, I think this is a big, based on my knowledge of, and some of my time spent in Ohio, I think this is a big opportunity for the state of Ohio is to look at how um, roundabouts can be integrated into your, your interchanges and your ramp terminals. Um, driving there just a couple of weeks ago, it wasn't uncommon to see a lot of the ramps, again, backing up onto the highway. Um, what if we could look at the different type of control? Of course, DDIs can help alleviate, that's diverging diamond interchanges can help alleviate some of those issues as well, depending on what your traffic volumes are. Um, but really challenging ourselves because um, whether it's a, a very rural location or even an urban or suburban location, those roundabouts are so um, efficient. And so when operations become an issue and or safety, um, they can become a, a fairly quick fix uh, to address those issues. I also want to mention uh, the image on the right. I don't think you can see my mouse. Maybe you can. Um, so the, Im sorry, the image on the left, there's the upper roundabout there. There actually is a bridge pier in the middle of that um, center island at that particular location. So I think one of the only, maybe there's another, was maybe one other one in Kansas, but just thinking outside the box there, um, you've got a spot for your bridge pier um, as that, that flyover ramp um, um, loops from one highway to another. And that is just outside of Green Bay, that example there. Uh, for those who know me, um, I can't go through a presentation without uh, talking a little bit about high-speed um, roadways. Um, I do believe that um, the high-speed roadways are, are where we can get a substantial and significant um, safety benefit by having um, a roundabout at those locations. I am very, um, uh, I guess, conscious of not over-designing these in the rural locations, though. Um, just remember, you're comparing it to what probably was a stop control intersection. Possibly you might be considering a signal at that location. Of course, don't really love to see the signalized um, intersections um, in, in an isolated situation, but um, you could have some great, great safety benefits um, of roundabouts on high-speed roadways. And, and we do have, I gosh, we're probably close to um, 75 or, or more now of roundabouts on high-speed roadways. In Kansas, there's numerous roundabouts um, that have 65 mile an hour approaches. So we continue to, to see a variation in designs, I would say, um, in the rural environment. Um, but we, we need to remember that at, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're stewards of the taxpayer dollars. And we wanna make sure that we have a design that we're right sizing that design um, for the context and for the, the, the budgets that we have as well. I'm sharing these next couple of slides with you based, um, actually fully based on a conversation that I had a couple of weeks ago when I was at ODOT offices, um, is just, you know, having a, a kind of a checklist of what do I need to be looking for? If I'm a peer reviewer, or even if I'm a, if I'm a designer, or I'm, I'm reviewing for a colleague, um, knowing what to look for in a design. Um, in a lot of cases, it might not be your first, it might be your first roundabout, or you're just, you're in, um, you, you're not, you've taken a training class, but you're still, you still, you don't day in and day out live and breathe roundabouts. And that's okay, because most people don't. 
but what should you be looking for? What's that diameter? I, I actually had the opportunity to review a project while I was there, and immediately I said, well, how big is the diameter of the roundabout? And they said, well, I don't know. So we went and we checked, we scaled it off, and sure enough, it was well over 200 feet in diameter. Um, and immediately I said, if you're struggling right, if you're, they were having some issues in, um, from a capacity standpoint as well as, as looking at some of the geometric features. And just immediately I just said, let's look at potentially right-sizing that diameter, and let's go from there. Because sometimes if you start in the wrong spot to begin with, then that everything else kind of can accumulate related to some of the issues that you might have. So having a nice design review checklist I think is important. I'm not gonna go through everything here. Um, Victoria has a copy of my slides. I've made um, uh, PDF handouts um, and I'm hopefully Victoria can provide that to you all. Um, if you've been in the class, this is what I usually share in, in the class. Um, always adding to it, changing it. I've got a public education um, uh, piece to it now. And then peer reviews. I can't say enough about a peer review. I think everyone can learn from a peer review. Um, I think sometimes it, um, it, it really opens the doors to, to, to challenging ourselves in a good way, having a healthy debate perhaps about a feature or a, a dimension um, that really can make the project better. And ultimately, we all are on the same team. We all want the project to be successful. We want it to be safe. Um, we want it to be cost effective. And we want it um, you know, uh, to continue to have an efficient um, facility. So um, in the spirit of March Madness, um, I'm a big college basketball fan. I'm, I've come up with um, my roundabout elite eight. And I don't know about you guys, but um, my bracket is pretty much busted, except I've got one team that I picked to win it that's still in it. So I'm crossing. I'm not going to tell you who that is. I'm crossing my fingers that they go all the way because uh, that might be my only saving grace in my bracket this year. So I'm just going to run through what I'm going to call here my roundabout uh, elite eight in terms of, of, of opportunities that we have. So looking at phase design and construction and how that can reduce the risk sometimes of the traffic projections that we're looking at 20 years out. Right-sizing the roundabout to fit the context, not too big, not too small. Sight distance to the pedestrian crossings is essential. Pedestrian only cross one direction of travel at time and have shorter crossing distances. Single lane roundabouts only have eight vehicle-vehicle conflict points. Approach alignment is critical to speed control. Speed control and speed consistency are also critical. And then well-designed roundabouts save lives. And at the end of the day, that might be the most important piece. Um, a well-designed roundabout potentially um, can save lives and reduce uh, injury crashes on our networks. And we all have a role in that, and I think that's a very um, important role that we have. When we have something like the roundabout and that strategy, um, it's a great opportunity for us to, um, to make change uh, for, the, for the better, and for not only for um, the traveling public, but but for your community and for your families as well. So I'll pause there, um, see if there's any other questions, and I just think I've got a few more slides to go. There's a question that just came in. What are some qualities of an intersection that would result in a bad candidate for a roundabout? So not everyone would probably agree with me, but I like to step back and think, if there is an intersection, a roundabout could potentially be a viable alternative, just like the stop control, the stop signs in, in, um, might be the, the option. I think we've got roundabouts that have uh, freight trains going through them, that have light rail going through them, that have 12% grades coming into the roundabout, not through the roundabout, but the approaches coming into the roundabout. I think we're, it's, we're having a harder and harder time um, saying that roundabouts won't work here. Now, I think the exception to that would be, um, you know, in the U.S., we don't have a whole lot of experience of roundabouts that are handling over, I would say, 60,000 vehicles a day. So right now, um, we, we don't have that experience, and so I think there's some hesitation there, and I think that hesitation is okay. Um, I don't think roundabouts always have to be the solution, um, but I think they need to be put on the table and then you can screen them out. And I'm going to talk about the ICE, um, the intersection control evaluation um, policies that are, are now emerging in many, many states across the country. And that's one way of doing it. Keep the roundabout on the table. Um, 
as long as it's viable, as long as it makes sense. But then there are times where you do drop it. Um, it, it might be, um, you know, perhaps it, it might be a cost issue or perhaps it's a, it's a high capacity uh, location. Um, but I always like to, to make sure that we're, we're vetting as many alternatives as we can before we ultimately make a, a decision. Um, in the 2000 guide, we had a lot of, like, be careful, don't put a roundabout here. We got away, we, we did away with that in the 2010 um, uh, guide, and I think we'll continue to see that um, in, the, in the next guide that we actually have. Another question that just came in, do you have any insight as to how Amish buggies impact roundabout function and design? Okay, so we do have some good examples, I think, from um, Iowa, the state of Iowa, um, where we've got um, roundabouts in areas where there is, uh, there is an Amish population. Um, you know, things to think about is, you know, where are they going from point A to point B? Um, they are on the roadway themselves. Um, it, it, there shouldn't be um, significant barriers there. But again, having that conversation with the Amish community, um, if, if it happens to be a, you know, a project that they would be going through, I think just having that conversation, what are their concerns? Um, would it be the curbing? Um, would it be a lighting situation? Um, and finding out potentially um, what concerns they might have. But I really don't see it as, as an issue. They, it's, um, we, we have bikes, we have peds, um, we have trucks. We have all sorts of users, and, and really, we should just make sure we're, we're having that conversation with the Amish community, make sure we're not missing anything um, that might be a challenge for them at a roundabout. Hillary, here's another question about another user. Okay. Has there been instances where autonomous vehicles navigate through a roundabout? And then I've got two other questions that came in right behind that. Okay. So I'll take this one first, and then maybe I'll get through a few more slides, and then we'll come back to okay. the other two. So autonomous vehicles. Um, so as you know that there's certain markets in the U.S. that are exploring with the autonomous vehicles, um, to my knowledge, most of those are in areas, um, very urban areas, that there aren't many roundabouts. Um, of course, I don't know where, I'm not, personally, that's not an area that I am um, entrenched in, in terms of the autonomous vehicle and some of the, 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 the study areas that are going on there. Um, that is something that has come up in our TRB committee in terms of talking um, with the folks that are researching and, and the folks that are actually deploying these autonomous vehicles uh, and having that conversation with them at not only at the roundabout level, but just in general. Um, there's a lot of talk of, you know, following edge lines and, and things of that nature. Well, how does that pertain to a roundabout? So I think that is definitely that's something I could probably add to my emerging practices here in the future is um, how are we talking about uh, autonomous vehicles and roundabouts? And, and right now, the question has come up. Um, again, stay tuned to the TRB Roundabout Committee because that is something we've got a special um, subcommittee um, on emerging topics, but that is one of the ones. Uh, Ken Sides, actually, I believe, um, and maybe Joe Balskis are leading that effort. Okay, so Victoria, I'm going to go um, just get through a few more slides here at the end, and then I will absolutely take qu more questions. So I mentioned this back in September, the turbo roundabouts. And so to date, we still have no turbo roundabouts in the United States. But um, again, while I was in Ohio a few weeks ago, Arcadis was generous um, enough to bring in two of their international um, uh, colleagues uh, from Arcadis that are in the Netherlands office, um, or one of their offices in the Netherlands. And they did a great presentation on um, educating the group on roundabouts. Uh, our turbo roundabouts, but then also uh, challenging us in terms of how we see those fitting in in the U.S. We do have multiple jurisdictions that are looking at turbo, turbo roundabouts in the U.S., so I definitely see this as an emerging topic coming up. Um, and again, we're going to have to, we're really going to have to rely and, and have our international partners help us um, find um, how a turbo roundabouts might fit into our toolbox here in the U.S. Talk briefly about roundabout retrofits. You actually have a couple of roundabout retrofits in Ohio. Um, Franklin County has done one, going from two lanes to one lane. And then um, I believe uh, Letty Champ, it, it, City of Hilliard, is looking at um, not, not maybe major retrofits, um, but some minor retrofits to some of her roundabouts um, that um, will be coming up in, in 2018 here. But I'll share this example with you. This is a rural highway, isolated intersection, pretty steep grades. Um, but this is two-lane roads in each direction. 
um, except for at the roundabout. So you can only imagine what's going on, right? So the people know that you can, there's a second lane through the roundabout. So law enforcement, this is actually in Nevada, um, and law enforcement was noticing there was a lot of crashes and a lot of speeding that was going on because people were trying to pass each other before it went back down to the single lane. Um, if you go, went back, we went back to the designer and went back to the DOT, and they basically said, well, it was one of our first roundabouts on the state system, so we were probably a little bit conservative. So what they ultimately ended up doing after having a safety problem, a little bit difficult to see. This is Incline Village, if you ever want to look it up in, in, in Nevada. They actually painted out that um, second lane on the outside. There's like, some chevron hatching you'll see there. So they just use paint, and they've got some flexible tubes. And so it's now back to a, just an entirely a single lane roundabout, and it's working awesome. It was never, you never needed that second lane from a capacity standpoint. It, was, it turned out to be a safety issue, and they were able to go back to have a, a, a really nice operating roundabout there at that location. Um, I've got a little bit of video here. Um, maybe in the, with time, I think I, I might skip that. However, what I want to share with you here is this is a roundabout. This is in Roseville, California. And there's actually a signalized intersection to the left, and there's a signalized intersection just to the, um, I'm going to call it north here on this sheet. And so you've got a roundabout between two signals. Um, really, that major signalized intersection is that corridor on the top. Um, the other signal was actually put in there uh, near a parking lot um, to help meter, actually help meter traffic through the roundabout and then ultimately up to the signalized intersection. So they use simulation. Um, actually, I'll just play a little bit while I'm talking. Um, use simulation to help them make sure that they knew um, that this was going to function and how it was going to function. Uh, again, using a signalized intersection on a, on a minor, basically, access to um, some development. As a, as a metering tool um, for the roundabout um, and then ultimately out to the, the main corridor. So using the signalized intersection as a meter um, to and from the roundabout. Nice example. Um, again, we can, we can learn a lot. Intersection control evaluation. Um, I mentioned this back in September and um, I think we're hearing more and more about it. Um, I'd like to say after my visit two weeks ago that perhaps we can put Ohio as one of our light blue interest in the ICE policy. And um, the Ohio DOT is going to be working through um, some new guidance related to alternative intersections and interchanges, um, innovative intersections and interchanges. Um, Dave um, Holstein's group will be working on that here in 2018. Um, so we might see some ICE-related um, uh, performance-driven um, framework integrated into, into some of that new guidance related to alternative intersections and interchanges. So this was 2014. I'm just going to show you. Here's 2018. We actually have more states. Uh, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Florida are, are the newest states to um, have policies. Nevada is on the verge of, of um, releasing theirs, and more and more states seem to be interested, um, including yours, um, on the intersection control evaluation. So again, it's really meant to be transparent. It's meant to be um, making sure that we're comparing alternatives appropriately um, and, and vetting them um, and screening them um, at, the, at the right phase and stage of our projects. Again, that's a two-stage step, typically. Um, this is an example from Caltrans. And then ultimately, what you're ending up with is a, is a, it's a matrix, a performance matrix. Um, here you've got uh, looking at operations, capacity, safety, uh, right away, uh, costs, uh, project costs, environmental um, issues with the project itself, and looking at the life of the project in addition to the construction costs. Um, coming up here, you can see in the bottom, number 13, the safety benefit cost ratio was much more significant for the roundabout. The cost of the roundabout in this case was more, um, but at the end of the day, um, they saw that the roundabout was a long-term investment, and the signal probably would not have been a long-term investment. Um, and again, this does tie to the performance safety performance management uh, final rule, and, and so the effort um, for every state is to, to drive down the fatal and injury crashes that we have. So each state and MPO has set a target, um, and roundabouts and ICE are one way that we can definitely, hopefully, drive those numbers to, to zero, closer to zero. And, and that's not only on the state um, system, that's on the local system, um, the counties, the townships, uh, and, and the cities as well. One other new item I'm going to um, bring out here is what we're calling the safe systems approach or what our international partners have called the safe systems approach, where it's really um, challenging ourselves in terms of the decisions that we're making on the roadway. 
Um, the, the Swedish Vision Zero says it's unacceptable to trade off human life and health for other benefits of the transport system, for example, mobility. We need to start thinking about that probably more in the U.S., and I think there's a lot of efforts with Toward Zero Dust and Vision Zero um, where we're going to probably have to change some of the things that we're doing. We're going to have to – we have an opportunity, though, with, with alternative uh, specific to intersections, um, looking at reducing those conflict points, reducing speeds, um, and really changing the way drivers navigate through our, our, our conflict points, and that being intersections themselves. Just give you another image here from – some of the safe um, systems approach. Federal Highways is embarking on um, a project um, looking at safe systems approach uh, uh, framework for intersections. So stay tuned. Um, that project has, hasn't even gotten underway, um, but we um, are going to be able to be moving forward with it shortly. I'll pause there. Um, and Victoria, you said there was a couple questions. I know we're getting to be after the top of the hour here. So um, let's go ahead with a few more questions. Go ahead. I'll read them off to you. What is the current thinking regarding maximum profile grades on roundabout approaches? So I would say it all depends on what you can do through the roundabout itself. Um, our guidance, we, we try to table it or flatten it through the intersection itself, um, through the roundabout itself. 4% um, is that, um, that um, metric that we have used consistently, I would say, over the last 15 years in the U.S., and I think that pretty much still stands. Um, and, and again, I've, I've mentioned um, there's many states that have approaches coming into roundabouts that are 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. In Washington State, there's a couple that is a minor road, but it's a 12 percent grade that then flattens out in advance um, of the roundabout, and then the roundabout itself is, is probably more like a 3 percent grade going through the roundabout. It, it, it's an intersection. It is what it is. We do need to think about it. The roundabout does pose uh, different, question, or different questions for us as designers and practitioners in terms of um, our main, our, is, it a, is it a high truck volume? Would you have trucks turning left? And what does a truck going down an 8% grade into a roundabout that needs to turn left, what does that look like? And that's all... Um, all considerations that we have to make. And we, we could say that the same for a signalized intersection or a stop control. Stop control in that case will be a little bit different because you're requiring that vehicle to stop. But a green light on a signal, um, potentially a driver would be doing something something similar. So I think it's context. I think um, we that's, that's the engineering judgment part of what we do. You're not going to find um, a, a black and white answer out of a textbook or out of a guide for that. And that's where you have to think of what are the alternatives and, and is the roundabout the better alternative given that situation um, or is there some other type of design that might be better for that. Victoria? Other question, what strategies have been used to reduce volume on one road so that volumes are more balanced at the design roundabout? And then they gave an example of um, one that has a volume mismatch here in Ohio, but I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's Hayden Run Road and Britain Parkway. I can't, like, I recognize those names, but I can't say for sure <laughs> that I maybe have enough information. Now, if that, I would suggest that that person follow up maybe with me um, one on one or through you, Victoria, um, if that's a specific project that you're, you're looking at, maybe. Um, I don't know if it, so there's not a roundabout there or is there a roundabout there? I'm not sure of the question. You will have to wait for Chris to type some more in about it. All right. Why don't you we'll go ahead and move okay. forward we'll with follow. your slides. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Just a few more slides here. Folks, the other thing that Ohio DOT is looking at is they're going to be updating the roundabout guidance in 2018. So by hopefully January 1 of 2019, um, there'll be some updated guidance um, related to roundabouts. Now, the guidance that you have in there is, is great. You refer to NCHRP 672. Um, there's some specific dimensions that you're shooting for, some targets in terms of diameters for a single lane versus a, a two lane. Um, really uh, just an extension of what we have in 672. But um, I think the, the design group is looking to, to have a little bit more um, information uh, for the designers um, and, and traffic analysts in Ohio um, to, to move forward in, in 2019. Um, so uh, great resource, um, Teach America, looking at the, uh, 
posting of the International Roundabout Conference, so you can go to that website and, and find a lot of resources. Um, this is just the major updates. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, TRB is an NCHRP has, um, will be starting the update to, uh, or the, uh, a new guide, we'll call it a new guide, I don't know what they're going to call it yet, um, starting in um, mid-2018. So by summer we should see work starting uh, on um, a new guide for the U.S. that hopefully is out by 2020. Don't forget the roundabout inventory. Um, you can always contribute to that. Uh, Kittleson Associates has been very kind in updating that. Um, but if you're missing a roundabout or the information isn't quite right, um, that's a really nice resource that we have available to us. And last but not least, uh, you know, um, really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all last September um, at the 2017 uh, Ohio Roundabout Conference. And I, I think that was um, a really an engaging group and great information um, coming out of there. I'm sure you folks recognize some of the people at that table there. Um, and Victoria, I, I think you're planning on having another one. I don't know if you want to say anything at this time. We are, and I went ahead and put it in the chat pod earlier. Um, but if you want to mark your date, your calendar now for Tuesday, September the 18th, that date we have confirmed that Hillary is available and we've got a facility actually on the east side of Columbus by some additional roundabouts. Um, so we'll be doing a, a tour on that side of the city this year. And then Hillary is going to be available for three days after that to do roundabout training in Ohio. So if any LPAs are interested in helping to host an LTAP course at their location where Hillary would be teaching the roundabouts class, we would be happy to um, talk to you further about that. And I also have a follow-up on the um, question from earlier, if you want me to read that off to you now. On that example mm -hmm. of the volume mismatch, they say it's not a project. There's an existing roundabout. Because Hayden has a higher volume, it can be difficult during peak hours to get a gap when driving on Britain Parkway, the north-south route. So again, okay, the, so the base question was, what strategies have been used to reduce volume on one road so that volumes are more balanced at the design roundabout? OK, and so sometimes it's just a matter of, so that's what we might call reverse priority, <clears throat> where you've got such a heavy volume, it's shutting down the other approaches. Um, so a couple of things there. One is to look at the design. Um, is the design encouraging that? Um, and in terms of um, perhaps uh, the speeds and the alignment, um, maybe more of a radial alignment versus an offset left. And again, I don't, I'm not looking at that now. I'm not sure. I'm just trying to think out loud here a little bit. The other piece is that we have several agencies that have started considering when this has been happening is actually signalizing the approach. Um, so you do allow the minor route to get out. We do have a couple um, examples in the U.S. where that is occurring where you do actually signalize um, the major route and, and stop them so you can, um, at a certain point, you can let the, the minor route out. So it's more of a, a signaling or a metering. You've got a couple of other agencies that are looking at, could, could, we, could it be more of a meter situation versus a signal situation? And I'm hoping um, there's hopefully going to be some, um, hopefully we're going to get some research in this area soon here in the U.S. Um, where we might be able to, to consider that a little bit more. Um, actually, Carmel, Indiana did a little experiment with some metering on one of, uh, uh, on um, Keystone Parkway on one of those ramps. Uh, so, and like I said, there's a location in Florida and then Washington State also did some metering to try to address that issue. So it, it again, looking at the design, but then also if, if the design doesn't seem to be, um, uh, you know, facilitating um, the issues that you have there, it's just pure unbalanced flows and reverse priority, then perhaps looking at something like um, a, a metering type situation where you could actually stop that main line and, and allow for the others to go. Thank you very much. And yes, there's another question in the chat pod about a copy of the presentation. Hillary did email me a copy and I'll be making that available online via our webinars page, even if the recording itself wasn't successful. Hopefully it is though, and I'll be sending it all out together. So um, since we've run over, I'm just going to thank you, Hillary, for doing this for us. We so appreciate having you do these webinars for us here in Ohio. I know that we love roundabouts and we love having you you know assist us with getting these implemented on our roadways so um, 
if there's nothing further, I'm going to go ahead and, and end the webinar for everyone. Hillary, is there anything else you'd like to add? I just thank you again so much, Victoria, um, for all that you you do, um, not only with roundabouts, but all the um, opportunities that you provide folks um, to, to learn more um, and to grow our grow our toolbox. And my contact information is there. If you're interested in something more specific, <clears throat> please let me know. It's always a pleasure to spend time with the folks in Ohio. And again, I apologize uh, I'm contributing to the to the uh, overtime here. No, I you know I think most people do probably didn't mind. There's still 106 people on the call, so okay. thank you again. Sounds good. And thank you everyone for thank joining you. us. Have a good day. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.